This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back, we're live, and we're talking about something very important. We're talking about the press here on Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel, and I have the honor to, to uh, welcome uh, Brett Opegard of the University of Hawaii. Uh, he's an assistant or associate professor of journalism in the mm -hmm. School of Communications there. Welcome again yet, Bert. Yes, Brett. <laughs> thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Yeah, so um, uh, it's very important that we have this discussion. There's so many things flying around here at the beginning of the year. And somehow I think we have to take January 2nd as a kind of look down the field and try to figure out what's going to happen, not only in terms of the news, but the way the news is handled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first thing is you had an article last few days in Civil Beat, and you talked about the local press uh, trying to maintain some standards, ethical standards, uh, that you felt were not necessarily being maintained these days. Tell us about the article and your view. Right. Well, uh, the uh, industry itself has a code of ethics, or has se there are several code of ethics actually, but the primary one is the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. And uh, in the past, people have followed that uh, within their newsrooms, but not really told the public much about it. And my argument basically is we need to uh, explain uh, our code of ethics as journalists and then live up to those. And that allows the readers, our viewers, our listeners, to understand behind the scenes what we do and how we do it, and then if we don't follow that code, then we then we have to answer to them. Yeah. So what what is missing now in the you know the local view of this, the local implementation of the code? Well, there's a lot of uh, haphazard type of uh, application of um, say anonymity to sources or. Um, you know how how people gather news, what stories they report on. It's just not explained very well to the audience why they're doing what they're doing, and it gives the impression of a lot of quid pro quo or cronyism within the media that I think would be uh, primarily eliminated if you just explain, you know, why you're doing this and how you're doing it. So, okay, what 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 the ideal then is? I read. Uh, any article in any local paper or any paper at all, mm -hmm. and I come away with a or sense... Or watch it on the broadcast news. Thank you, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. um, or, or on the internet. I mean, it really yeah. pretends or listen to, to be it on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. Hawaii Public Radio. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I should come away with a feeling that they are representing me, uh, that they're delving into these things on my behalf, that they're telling me a lot, as much as they can, I don't know where the boundary is, about the, the process of gathering that information uh, and you know refining it and connecting it with other information. Um, and I should feel a level of confidence that this particular news organization is uh, really doing its job mm -hmm. in terms of letting me see the process by which they have gathered and present this information. Yeah. Absolutely. It should be uh, very clear when you read or listen or watch a story uh, where the information comes from, you know, should be a properly sourced with a person's name and title, uh, and you can either imagine they interviewed that person directly or the person provided a statement or whatever it is, and that should be made clear too. A lot of times uh, I've seen where press releases are turned into quotes without attribution to a press release, so it looks like somebody is talking to a news organization and they're really not. And there have been a couple notorious examples in the last year where a television station has received the same press release as everybody else, and they put it on their website, and they'll say, exclusive, you know, <laughs> here's, here's our scoop, because, you know, we, we published our, the press release that everybody else got at the same time first. Yeah. And that's the kind of um, shady behavior that I think would be eliminated with um, a, a more uh, open and transparent process. Yeah. yeah. So and what, what should they properly do? Because, I mean, every significant company out there now has a, a PR firm or a PR communications director who writes press releases. Some of them are former journalists, by the way. Mm -hmm. And they write very nice press releases, but they're written you know, from the bias of that organization. It's mm -hmm. not really reporting. It's, it's advocating for the benefit of that organization. Um, so now I'm going to send my press release into into a, a publication, a news organization, and um, the news organization has to deal with that. So one is, I suppose, in, in, a, in a fully ethical and appropriate manner, they would they would um, assign that 
press release, if they thought it was important enough, to a reporter. And mm -hmm. he would call somebody mm -hmm. or do some research or mm -hmm. a combination of that. And he'd write the story that was fomented by that press release. Mm -hmm. uh, another possibility, which I think you're talking about, is you get the press release um, and, you, um, and you republish it. But I suppose that the appropriate thing to say is, this is a press release from XYZ Company. We're merely reprinting what they sent us. And the third, uh, the, the worst example, uh, is when you take the press release, make it your own story as if you report, you're reporting on it, as if right. you did the research to validate what's in this, ad, uh, this advocating type, you know, bias type press release. Right, yeah, and that's because uh, newsrooms are getting smaller and smaller and more and more strapped. Uh, a lot of people have started to do that as, as, re as a regular part of their journalistic process, which it isn't and it shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, uh, a friend in, in another area that moved into a government agency. He was a former journalist for uh, decades. And he started. He, he asked um, uh, the broadcast news to come out and do some reporting on this subject that he wanted, but they wouldn't come out. So he uh, set up a tripod, filmed himself, answering questions that he created for himself, <laughs> sent it into the television station, and they broadcast it on the, on the news as if they did that reporting. Oh, and that's the kind of stuff that um, happens all the time. But the TV station knew that this was this And the TV was station knew, yeah, and, uh, it was all part of the deal. Yeah, Like yeah. they didn't have to send their reporter out and... Yeah, um, it's all about money. It's, yeah, it's just very scandalous. And the, um, so, the answer is to be transparent, to say, if you're just going to quote a press release, say, in a press release, so-and-so said such-and-such, right. and just leave it at that. You never see that, though. You don't see that. <laughs> and that's where the code of ethics would come into play. Yeah. And so my argument is each news organization, it doesn't have to be the SPJ code of ethics because there are several others, uh, but they have to say, we follow a code of ethics. Here it is. Here's all the um, statements about anonymous sources or using press releases or reporting on someone else's story. That's another one I wrote a column about recently where um, one uh, journalist in town would break a story and other people would come in and grab it for their own and basically start on top of his shoulders and, and start reporting and then take over the story. Yeah. You know, and so, without giving the original person the credit for breaking it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of this behavior behind the scenes that it does give does uh, give sympathy to the idea that people criticize the media, and the idea that um, some news uh, I wouldn't use the term fake news, but I would say that there's there's better news and there's worse news, and and uh, we should push for better news. Yeah, well, suppose uh, I give you a scenario, see what you think. I'm a struggling news organization. I don't have a lot of extra money. I don't have reporters, which I don't pay them very well anyway, but, um, but they're still expensive in a struggling organization. Mm -hmm. And I can't cover all these things. I get a press release. Um, I have no knowledge of this, and I have no reporter to develop knowledge of this. Do I reprint the press release, I guess, with credit, um, as that is a press release? Do I reprint the press release in the context of a kind of an opinion reaction and say, you know, gee whiz, I'm not sure this really works. Hmm. Um, or do I ignore the whole story? Mind you, I have to save money. <laughs> well, it depends on the story. I mean, okay. it depends on what the press release is about. There's, there's every day, uh, every news organization gets hundreds of press releases. So they're already filtering out the, the very best to uh, acknowledge. Um, I, ha I have another uh, friend who used to work in newspapers, and he um, became a PR person. He would write these press releases, and he told me that the dream scenario is for a media organization to just publish his press release as is, and he said he doesn't care if they put their byline on it or what. <laughs> and so that's the kind of dynamic that you're dealing with in, the, in, in this, uh, this basically... Um, grappling between public relations people and journalists. Yeah, I mean, the public relations people want it. They don't want it to say it's a press release because that diminishes it. So they're going to sure. argue that it should, and they don't ever complain if uh, you take it as is without giving them credit because that's what they want. They want it to basically be infiltrated into the news 
and appear as if a hardworking journalist vetted it in some way. That's deceptive because they haven't done the reporting. They haven't done the reporting. They so, haven't checked it out. They haven't called anybody, talked to anybody, verified anything. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know the ideal, um, of course, is to put a journalist onto the story and have them report it fresh. Like you can use it as an idea and then start from there and start asking people questions about it. And if there's certain numbers or facts in there that, you, that the journalist wants to use and say according to a press release, blah, 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 that's fine. But when, uh, when it starts to just get dumped in, um, and, and this has happened in many news organizations locally, where they just dump it in, and, and I've even written about people putting their own bylines on a press release, uh, that's where you start to, the audience starts to lose trust. And really, journalists have nothing but their integrity. That's the only capital they have. And the, organiz the news and organization, the organization allows them to do that. Yeah. Is it possible that, they, that the, <clears throat> the, the journalist would do that? He would sort of steal the press release, put his own byline on it, and not say anything? Uh, wouldn't the editor know? Uh, it's hard to say if the editor would know because it depends on how the relationship between the editor and the reporter. But certainly everybody else who got the press release would know. And that's how I would find out about these somebody stories. Somebody calls them on it. Yeah, somebody calls them on it. Some other news organization says, hey, I got this press release. <laughs> I got the yeah, same one I got the same got. one. It has this person's <laughs> byline on it. This is, uh, that's you know, funny. and that's, that's part of the role that I have at Civil Beat is, is bringing these things to to the attention of the public because there really isn't anybody else in uh, in the area that writes about these kinds of issues. And before I did it, the, that same scenario would have went unchecked. Well, something you've said a number of times, and that is the little papers, the ones who don't have the money for original news, and the big papers, there's a big disparity now, and mm -hmm. getting bigger, and the ones, the smaller ones going out of business, and the bigger ones uh, are left as the only ones, really the only significant original news um, newspapers, uh, or news organizations uh, on the field. And, and it's, it's changed, am I right? It's changed in the past few years. The little ones are going out of business and the big ones find that they're the only ones left. You know, a number of less, fewer Indians, so to speak, on the field. Yeah, it's really um, the very smallest, like the weeklies, are doing okay. Uh, the small dailies are doing okay because nobody else is reporting about those. It's more of the regional dailies that used to be prominent um, journalistic forces in the country. You know, the Seattle Times, the Oregonian, uh, the New Orleans paper went out of business or, or dropped down to several or, or went from daily to, you know, a couple times a week. Um, yeah. And all, all these have been severely damaged. So basically you have the biggest in the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, uh, doing a lot of original work. And then you have the very smallest, but you, we've lost literally kind of that middle class of journalists. Yeah. So you get the Times, I mean, the internet has changed things too. I can get the Times on the internet for probably the same price that I would pay for a local, smaller, less effective newspaper. Um, so I'd rather actually read the Times. But the problem is, I don't get the local news that way, or the regional news, as the case may be. Um, so there's a black hole there. There's a, there's, a, there's a vacuum for the local news, and I lose something because what do they say? All news is local. All politics is local, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, do you see a change in that? I can get the national news. I can get it from nationally respected newspapers. We talk about who they might be, but I, I can't get local news the same way, and I can't get it on the internet, and I can't get it original, and I can't get it clean of of articles that are really press releases. Yeah, the term that uh, has emerged is called a news desert, and people are living in these news deserts where it'll be no original news within hundreds of miles of them, I mean, literally. Uh, you can look on a map, and um, what happens then is people do go to the national news, but if it's, um, you know, some if they have say low media literacy and end up at uh, say a Breitbart or some some uh, skewed site like that, then their whole world gets distorted dramatically, yeah. Yeah. and they have no local checks and balances, no um, you know n nobody to really say that there's there's another side to the story. It's so important that yeah. we that we have good news. Um, let's take a short break. Uh, Brett Obergard, um, uh, associate professor of journalism at the uh, School of, for um, Communications at UH Manoa, uh, talking about how the war, we'll, we'll get to this right after the break, how the war in the press has affected the press 
We'll be right back. Aloha kako. I am Andrea. I am from Italy, and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there, right now, using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talents Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future. Starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Okay, as you may know, we're here with Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Tuesday the 2nd, and we are joined by Brett Obergard, uh, Associate Professor of Journalism at UH Manoa. So we were talking uh, before uh, about the, you know, the, the Sahara, if you will. <laughs> what, what did uh, Sahara the Bozart, H.L. Mencken in, in, the, uh, yeah. in, in the New York 30s. Um, so this is the Sahara, Sahara of the news. How does that affect the bubble process and, and the polarization process uh, where, where people are, you know, in, in great disagreement about views that they could, not, uh, they could not understand the other guy's views and they don't accept any view but their own? Well, I think it pushes people to the national um, bubbles as opposed to the local community paper it used to be the place where everybody in the town would would uh, share that news and talk about it at the at the local diner or or, uh, or at the local uh, bar or whatever. And without that, um, I think it isolates people into the national bubbles even more than uh, before, and yeah. we end up with uh, folks that really just can't tolerate or or talk to each other. Yeah. Well, talking to each other seems to me part of the Ben Franklin democracy we all got started with here. Yeah. And that you have to have local discussions with your friends and neighbors and test your ideas out, hear their ideas, and ultimately form opinions so that you can make intelligent votes and participate in the civic process. And if you don't have those conversations, democracy suffers over it. If you only have bubbles, it doesn't work as well. Yeah, and if it's, it's really easy to demonize the national figures, uh, Trump or Pelosi or whoever, and... Uh, view them as non-human, you know, uh, demons. Yeah. And what we really need is people who disagree at a local level start the conversation and say, well, you know, what do you, what do you think about this issue? Why do you think that? And then try to find common ground. Not yeah. easy, but try yeah. to find common ground. And a newspaper, local newspaper, helps you do that. I mean, a good one. Yeah. Because um, if, you know, it's actually in the, in the world of the bubble in the past year anyway, um, people on one side of the bubble or the other don't talk to each other. They don't want to get into an argument. Oh, they hate each other. They hate each it's other. Becomes, so it's not even... Shut uh, down. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like the take people off your friend list on Facebook and, you know, yeah. take them off your Christmas card list. And it's, it's just, just not become a good democracy. No. So let's talk about the... This is a hard question that we have in front of us here. Um, how, how does the war on the press, Trump's war on the press, affect the press? Um, you know, he's into uh, uh, fear and uh, bullying, and uh, he, he, he creates fear in the press, or tries to, and he does bully them, as he does a lot of people in the world. Um, how does that affect the way the press works in this country? Well, I think uh, journalism over the past, you know, several decades before Trump had gotten, at least from, from maybe like late Watergate to um, pre-Trump, had gotten kind of soft and um, lazy, to be frank. And I think uh, this has exposed really a lot of the weaknesses of journalism. Mm. And I, I, I guess I would say that um, it certainly is rooting out the weakest parts of the system, where um, only the strong are surviving. Now, how can... Uh, what does strong mean in this context? Well, I would say the strong, the, the strong with the most resources, the most... Um, uh, of a foundation in journalism as opposed to a foundation in selling advertising. I think that's really a big difference in how some media organizations operate. 
the ones who are really just in it to make a buck, you know, like the people who have been bought up by Gannett or some of these other chains that really it's all about the profit margin. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that just are getting wiped out because they don't, they can't go back to their journalistic ideology of what they're there for in the first place. They're there for uh, journalism. They're not there to sell advertisements. Yeah. So we and, have to have to make distinction. Yeah. And, and, they, I, and, and I suppose uh, you know, it's the media has shown us uh, what was the uh, the the, the um, paper in Boston, the Boston Globe. Mm -hmm. which I think it's a subsidiary of the New York Times. It was, and I got sold. I don't think okay. they are now. But yeah. and it was it's called Spotlight, uh -huh. and it was a story of abuse in the church. Right. Uh, and uh, the paper kept on investigating. Ultimately, broke the story and changed things, at least in Boston, in the church. Uh, and then, of course, um, you know this this news this uh, newspaper movie called The Post by Steven Spielberg, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with the Pentagon Papers is just coming out in a few weeks, I think. It's not quite out yet. Um, that's going to be very interesting because that's about Catherine Graham, the same lady who stood who stood firm on, on Watergate, the same kind of issue. Yeah. Uh, she, she went through uh, uh, revealing the Pentagon Papers even under threat of prosecution. Right. And uh, she might have gone to jail over that, but, but she, she cut new turf and defended the paper and took the right position. And of course, uh, this thing in the, the Morning Times, uh, today the New York Times, by A.C. Sulzberger, mm -hmm. author C. Sulzberger, who's the new publisher of the Times, and actually you know him, mm -hmm. you had experiences with him. Mm -hmm. um, Wonderful guy. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and, very he, excited and for he him. wrote yeah. the manifesto of how he feels about the Times. It's really worth taking a look at. He talks about independence, how important it is for a newspaper to be independent. He talks about uh, serving the public. He talks about uh, avoiding uh, stories and and the perception of being afraid of fear or favor, giving favor to certain interests. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's all about independence. One word, it's all about independence. And so the Times has to be one of those big ones you talked about. And the Globe, I'm not sure who owns it or what the control <laughs> is. Uh, I'm not sure I include the Wall Street Journal, uh, although it, once it's being sold lately. Um, and, um, and of course, I do include the Washington Post. But how many others are like that? where the giants, where they can stand up against government. Many. Yeah. I mean, USA Today has never won a Pulitzer Prize. They're, not, <laughs> they're no uh, bastion of journalism. Yeah. Uh, so you really, you, you have very few. And what I think um, we've, we've uh, discovered in the past few years is that, you know, if you commoditize journalism and make it into every town has the same stories, every town has the same uh, you know, approach, then it's it'll it'll just die. There's no, like I said, there's no strength to that. Yeah. And what they need is uh, to go back to the foundations of what, you know, at least 20th century, 20th century journalism was about, which is finding out information that other people in power don't want you to know and sharing it with the people who need it. And mm -hmm. that, you know, it, uh, we we've kind of lost our way in a lot of in a lot of respects, uh, becoming entertainment or um, you know publishing press releases or whatever it is that paid the bills instead of really focusing on um, what journalism is. Well, this certainly brings to mind all those TV um, news, uh, news uh, programs, including both sides of the fence. You know, Fox News is probably the worst offender of the manifesto and the ethics. Uh, mm -hmm. and, then, and then you have CNN, which actually is sort of the mirror image of the same kind of thing. And MSNBC, the uh, same kind of thing. Are they doing their job? Would you, how would you compare them you know, with A.C. Sulzberger uh, and the New York Times? <laughs> well, uh, MSNBC is uh, what I would say, say is kind of the mirror of Fox, uh, although they do a lot of things better than Fox. Uh, CNN is supposed to be in the middle. But I think uh, one of the big problems with CNN and, and all these um, networks is they're, they're really about making money mm -hmm. instead of um, getting to the bottom of things. Mm -hmm. You know, CNN's classic setup is put five people at a table. You have two on the left, two on the right, one, one kind of sane voice in the middle, and let them banter for an hour, and then we'll sell a bunch of ads. You know, that's not really um, what, what I would consider great journalism. And yeah. that's where they have to put, I think, you know, CNN and, and a lot of them really have to look in the mirror and say, what are, what are we really doing here? Is it likely that somebody else is going to come up on that stage? Another, another you know, news show, one of the uh, big um, news organizations uh, come out and do better? 
on television? Well, definitely on the internet. There have been a lot of startups that have done a lot, lot better. You know, yeah. Vice and uh, Fox, and there's all sorts of, um, you know, basically com competitors for that space. They're much smaller, but they do a better job with the journalism part. Now, will they, um, you know, ever make as much money as CNN? I doubt it, but maybe that's not the point. Point is, are they giving better, <laughs> better journalism, better information to people for, for our democracy and strengthening our democracy? And in, in a lot of respects, they're doing that. Yeah, problem. I mean, at the end of the day, though, you have to have somebody, whether it's the Times or, or the Globe or the Post, um, who has the money, the resources to send uh, investigative reporters out there, mm -hmm. um, to do, um, to do uh, original reporting, because that's the kind that counts. Uh, you know, so many other papers just deal on, on somebody else's original reporting. They never mm -hmm. really know whether the original reporting that they're using is actually correct. Mm -hmm. uh, they just they buy it kind of thing, and I, that's, that's dangerous too, isn't it? Um, so I well, guess they create a lot of meta narratives that never get checked, and that's uh, yeah. become a big problem. You know, yeah. you think about our wars, for example. Yeah. The meta narrative is that you know we're always. Surging and winning, or, <laughs> but you know, after after thirteen, fifteen, whatever, how many years, it's probably not the real narrative. The real narrative is that this was, you know, a failed idea from the beginning, and no matter how much we put into it, we're gonna we're gonna uh, never succeed. So um, that's where the standing on shoulders uh, problem really manifests itself. If somebody publishes a piece with original reporting, and then people are always stacking on top of each other. They're not going back to recheck their assumptions from the beginning, and it can you can imagine the skew that you would get from dangerous. It. Yeah. So you know, but if I were Trump, and I were trying to make sure that I was trying to beat off anybody who would tax me, I would beat off the guys who do the original news and the in-depth reporting. Mm -hmm. If I uh, sort of discredit them, and then I'm way ahead because everybody else is buying their stuff, and then I wind up discrediting everybody down line as well right. as the yep. New York Times. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a smart strategy. Um, and if he can ultimately discredit the New York Times, we're all in a confusion about fake news and discredited news. This is very troubling. So um, I mean, it's uh, only smart if you, if you think the, the fascism strategy is a good one. I mean, if you think like the strongest democracy is where we're really going to succeed, then it's a terrible strategy. So, um, you know, it's like one of those, um, again, the meta narratives that people play out is the idea is Trump should win. Well, no, he shouldn't win. Democracy should win because that's uh, much more important than any one person. Yeah. And there, therefore, uh, you know, a lot of times people get into his tactics and strategies about the media and miss the bigger point is the, the president of the United States is attacking the First Amendment of our Constitution. Yeah. Well, the president, I've thought about this too, for the president of the United States to attack the press, that is to attack the First Amendment, is um, it's a violation of constitutional principles. It's a violation of the oath of the, of, that he took yeah. on the first day. Yeah. yeah, and it's very dangerous for the country and the democracy and the way forward. So what, you know, if, if you look at uh, Salzberger's uh, statement this morning in, in the Times, uh, he says exactly what I would want him to say. And essentially, uh, without going into a lot of criticism over Trump, he's just saying, we're, we're, we're going to stay the course. Mm -hmm. You know, you can trust us. Yeah. We're going to follow the rules. We're going to follow the ethical codes. We're not going to be swayed by fear or favor. We're going to be independent. And recognizing that they're an original news source, this has huge effect not only for their readers, but the readers of every publication that repeats them. <laughs> yeah, right. So for the moment, we feel safe. But down the line, how safe do you feel, all of that considered? Well, I, I, don't, I don't feel safe at all unless every, every media organization makes a similar pledge. You know, uh, I've, I asked the 10 biggest uh, media organizations in Oahu um, what code of ethics they followed, and several of them didn't follow any, and several didn't answer. So... Um, <laughs> what, what concerns me is that, you, you know, if we have put all our eggs in the New York Times basket, it's, it's great. We have the New York Times and the Washington Post and some of the other, uh, you know, CBS News or whatever. But um, we really need to develop it all the way through from the, the small players, the weeklies, the day, small dailies, the 
um, tabloids all the way up through the regionals to the to the big um, mm -hmm. big players because really if you look at the uh, ecosystem the New York Times doesn't report stories outside of say New York and LA and some of the big areas all that other news from the rest of the country comes from those smaller um, papers yeah and uh, without those, we really um, even get funneled more and more into a New York-centric yeah. uh, viewpoint. Which is not really the view. We want to have a broader array of sources and views. Well, diverse, diversity is the strength of this country. Yeah. And without it, uh, I don't care what, you know, what monolithic idea comes forth, it's not going to be good for us. <laughs> so if I tell you, I'm the president, and I tell you, look, um, I found a mistake in one of your stories. Mm -hmm. I found a reporter who did not conduct himself properly. Um, and I take you to task on anything I find. And, I, and I'm watching you every day. I have my legions of people watching you, see if they can find a mistake. Um, what effect does that have on the Times or any other original source? Um, what I worry about is that they'll become reserved, uh, reticent. They mm -hmm. won't report a story they're not really quite sure about. Um, they'll they'll take a position that'll be more conservative, more, you know, self-preservation, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, not not take any risks, um, um, require too much verification. Who knows what? Mm -hmm. So that we just don't get the information. Is that a possible effect of this war on the press? Uh, it's it's highly likely, and I've seen it in newsrooms I worked in on, on a much smaller scale where. A local auto dealer, you know, doesn't want a, a story about, um, you know, Pintos blowing up or something. You mm -hmm. know, even though it has nothing to do, they don't sell Pintos. They just don't want cars blowing up on the newspaper. Right. And um, that, that's always part of the story as the outside influences, which is why the New York Times statement is so powerful. Yeah. That we're not, um, we're not serving those people. We're serving our readers. Yeah. And our readers' uh, interests is, is number one in, in, in our minds. So you and I have discussed this before, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that it's building up to more than it was. This issue is now, we, we now know sort of the outlines are becoming more clear of what we have here, the, the war in the press and the way it works in this country, the way the press is, is evolving these days, or devolving as the case may be. Um, and I wonder, you know, the, the burden is still on the individual citizen to do his duty as a citizen, mm -hmm. to be informed, to have those engagements and conversations and, and learn and form good opinions so he can vote properly. Um, so at this point in time, January 2nd, Brett, there's camera one. What's your advice to the public, to the reading public, to the citizenry, the electorate, the voters? What's your advice? Uh, find lots of sources and check everything you read, you know, especially the more important the story is to you, the more you should check it. And that's um, really what it's all about. Now, I will say a couple things about um, the responsibility of citizen. It is a responsibility of citizen, but there's also a systemic responsibility of, for the country to teach citizens how to be citizens. And there have been a couple uh, recent laws passed um, requiring media literacy in a state education curriculums. And I think that's um, something kind of like you lose PE, you lose home ec, you lose, you know, you don't have media literacy and suddenly you have to go out for every meal, you have to buy your, you know, you get a rip in your shirt, you got to buy a new one. I mean, all these things are systemic uh, issues. I like think if you can't uh, understand how the media works, then you can't really function outside of its, um, you know, say, say advertising uh, paradigm where they want to sell you things. And, um, you know, it's a really important part. And also, I, want to, I wanted to circle back to one thing you said about um, people watching the journalists making sure they do things right. They should watch the journalists. They should make the, sure they do things right. It should be 100% true, every story. And if they're not true, that's what the whole correction uh, uh, mechanism is for. So, um, and the New York Times does a great job of this. They've, They've made corrections a hundred years later. You know, they make corrections whenever they find out something's wrong. So the journalist should publish things that they are confident is true. If they get it wrong, it doesn't matter if it's a source, it doesn't matter if like, oh, that's too bad, that really hurts my feelings that I got that wrong. There's lots of ways to get things wrong. You know, source can tell you wrong things. Um, but you correct it. And that's the bargain with your reader. 
bargain with the reader is, I'm going to tell you everything that's true, I'm going to tell you how I do it, and when I get it wrong, I'm going to correct it. Just as the citizen has a relationship with government, and government has a relationship with the citizen, mm -hmm. the citizen has a relationship with the press, and Absolutely. the press has a relationship with the citizen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brett Obergon. Oh, thank you Associate again. Professor of Journalism at <laughs> UH Spinoza.